And this is the Convict Australia podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Years ago, I visited Port Arthur in Tasmania, and I stood outside facing the ocean, taking in the surrounding hills, and I tried to contemplate what life was like for convicts who had passed through there. Looking around and taking it all in, I remember feeling this overwhelming sense of utter isolation from the rest of the world. I stared out at the ocean and saw it as the highway, the only way in and the only way out. When I turned to look at the surrounding scrub and took in its raw beauty, I also thought how dense, unfamiliar and uninviting it would have seemed to them. I could almost feel the desperation and sense of hopelessness of the convicts that had passed through the place. The feelings of being dumped and forgotten about and a shiver went down my spine. So it came as no surprise to me that the thoughts of some convicts were plagued with the ideas of escape. Port Arthur was chosen for its remote location, a place of banishment that was thought to be impossible to escape from. For this reason, repeat absconders and some of the most troublesome offenders were sent there. It soon developed a reputation as a place worse than death, with its harsh psychological punishments back-breaking tasks and cruel overseers. Thomas Lempierre, the Assistant Commissary General, claimed that Port Arthur was known as the Earthly Hell. Port Arthur was on the Tasman Peninsula that was surrounded by ocean by one tiny strip of land which had been named Eagle Hawk Neck. I urge you to look for it on a map. You'll be surprised at how narrow this land is. It's like a bridge connecting one peninsula to the other. This stretch of land was only about 60 metres wide. It was recognised as an easy point to prevent escapees from getting to the mainland. So authorities made it a formidable place to pass. They started by posting guards there. They built huts and sentry boxes, which sporadically dotted the area, and the men were regularly patrolling it with their loaded guns. Every effort was made to make the pass impenetrable. Lamps were strategically placed along the road using whale oil to keep them alight. Seashells were collected and scattered along the path to help illuminate the passage even further. However, they soon discovered that having the sound of the surf crashing on the east side of the neck made it difficult to hear anyone approaching. John Peyton Jones of the 63rd Regiment came up with the idea of enlisting the help of watchdogs. If anyone dared to approach, the dogs would bark and snarl, alerting the guards. The dogs were given ferocious names and rumours were spread about their viciousness and ability to tear a person to pieces in order to deter any convicts coming anywhere near the pass. The dogs were chained at different spots, making a line along the neck but their chains were long enough to meet the next dog, making it impossible to get past them. The strip became known as the dog line. The only other way to get out of Port Arthur was by swimming past Eagle Hawk Neck, so they built platforms in the sea at regular intervals and stationed a dog on each. Guards would have to row out to them daily to deliver their rations of one pound of meat and bread per day, the same rations that were given to convicts. If anyone tried to swim past the dogs, they would bark and alert the guards. Authorities also circulated stories that the waters were shark infested and helped the stories along by throwing offal into the water in the hope of attracting sharks to the area. But despite their efforts... Authorities underestimated the convicts' desperation to escape the earthly hell, as many knowingly risked their lives to get across, a slim chance at freedom being more appealing than another day in hell. Most escape attempts were done in the surf, but there was one man, a convict by the name of George Hunt, who made his attempt on land. George 
or Billy as he was known, had spent his days of youth travelling around with a group of swindlers before being caught and sent to the colonies. So it was of no surprise that Billy tried to outsmart the sentries by coming up with a very creative and elaborate plan of dressing up as a kangaroo in order to get past them undetected. However, Billy didn't anticipate just how hungry and bored the guards on duty were, and they not only noticed him, or rather the kangaroo, but they thought he'd make a pretty good meal. According to Lempierre, one guard exclaimed, I think I will have a shot at that boomer. When Billy heard this, he quickly shed the kangaroo skin and exclaimed, Don't shoot! I am only Billy Hunt! Billy went on to make many more escape attempts and earned himself a range of punishments. At the end of his time, Billy had been charged for at least 64 offences and had received a total of 1,800 days in leg irons, 625 lashes and spent 131 days in solitary confinement. Want to hear more great stories about convicts? Then grab a copy of Convict Sydney, the real-life stories of 32 prisoners. From Elizabeth Sullivan, who was known about town as the fighting hen of Cook's River, with her flamboyant dress and tough countenance. To Robert Sidaway, who entertained local residents by hosting dramatic performances in his theatre. These colourful characters and their individual experiences offer a broader insight into the daily happenings of Sydney and the convict system. To get your copy, just click on the link in the show notes. Another attempt to pass the neck was made at the peak of its security, and this time successfully. Martin Cash was described in the Sydney Gazette as a tall, powerful man and an excellent bushman. He was said to have been six foot tall, with curly, carroty hair, red whiskers and a ruddy complexion, and had remarkably long feet, making him a swift runner. Cash was a notorious runaway and managed to make it through the surf, but was captured on the other side, half starved and in a weakened state. He was promptly returned to Port Arthur. However, it wasn't long before he teamed up with two other convicts named Lawrence Kavanagh and George Jones. Together, they escaped and attempted to cross the neck. They waited till nightfall before making their move. Cash described the scene. We could see the line literally swarming with constables. They silently wade into the water with their clothing bundled and fastened to their heads, It was pitch black. They only had the light of the moon to guide them. Cash soon lost sight of his friends. Suddenly, a wave crashed over him, sending him tumbling and carrying his bundle of clothing away. Realising it was futile to try and look for it in the dark, he pushed on, fearful that his friends had been eaten by sharks. To his relief, he soon heard his mates talking as he approached the bank. In fact... He heard Jones say to Kavanagh, Martin's drowned. And they got quite a fright when Cash leapt out in front of them. The three fell about laughing in relief, especially when they saw that all three of them were completely naked, having lost all their clothing in the ocean. Now they faced a tough journey through the bush, and their bodies soon became so lacerated that they decided to wait until daylight so they could find an easier path. Still, they were able to laugh at their naked predicament. The next day, the men came upon a hut. Cash was already familiar with the hut. He knew that prisoners who were nearing the completion of their sentences were stationed there with one overseer. They were working on the roads in the immediate area. What happened next was described by Cash in his personal narrative. We all three simultaneously rushed into the hut, Kavanagh having an axe in his hand which he found at the door. I shall never forget the look of horror and amazement with which we were regarded by the unfortunate man inside, who, upon seeing three naked men rushing into the hut, one of whom was brandishing an axe, resigned himself to his fate, 
standing transfixed with his mouth and eyes opened, appearing to be in a perfect state of bewilderment. The men then tied the unsuspecting man to a post and ransacked the hut, finding new boots and clothing to wear. They then raided their food, filling sacks with flour, bread, fresh beef, tea and sugar, and taking a steel flint and tinderbox before fleeing. The story of their escape quickly circulated throughout the community, giving hope to their fellow convicts. The three men became well-known gentlemen bushrangers. Over time, a growing community was living and working at Eagle Hawk Neck, but in November 1873, it was closed down. Soon, the buildings fell into disrepair, and all that is left to mark this historic location is a bronze sculpture of a savage-looking dog chained to a barrel and a cut through the sand dunes. There also remains one of the officer's quarters dating back to 1832, which has been restored and turned into a museum. It tells the story of the dog line and the history of Eagle Hawk Neck. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you for listening to the Convict Australia podcast. If you'd like to show your appreciation and get more involved, there are a number of ways you can. The first is by signing up to Convict Australia on Patreon and you will get some perks like the Convict Australia newsletter. Secondly, leave a review and tell your friends and family. This really does make a huge difference. And lastly, join the Facebook and Instagram group Convict Australia. All the links I've mentioned will be in the show notes. Thank you again. Till next time.